Good evening, everyone. Please feel free to continue eating. I just wanted to kick us off so we can stay on time tonight. I love seeing a full room. Um, for those of you who have been here before, we're not usually in the big room. This is an upgrade, and I, my goal for us is to always be in this room. So we need 60 people in attendance every month to get this room over our normal space room. So that's my 2024 goal for us. 60 people plus every month, big room. Good. All right, thank you for coming. This is our second event of the year. I'm moving on the stream. Um, we have our new 2024 board. I was fortunate enough to have a lot of our volunteer board members continue with us again this year. We only have one new member, Suzanne, and our VP of Programs, and we're set up for success because we're booked for the first six months of the year with programs. So thank you, Suzanne, and thank you to my board members. It takes a lot of work to pull off these events month over month with lots of great programming. So thank you to my team, and thank you to our advisors. So we have a MAC. It is CIO, CISO, CTO level advisors. We meet twice a year. Um, they help us come up with topics, speaker recommendations. Last year, they told us we should go on more field trips. So we went on the road and went to Blue Cross and Red Hat and Kendo and had a lot of fun. Um, so thank you to our Matt, one of which is Ken, who's our speaker tonight, so thank you for also participating in our Mac and being a speaker. Um, I told you our VPs have done a great job. We are set with programming for the first six months of this year. Save the date, put it on your calendar, plan to be here. We are here at the U Club um, tonight. Am I at the Okay. Um, tonight, March, April, May, we're going to take a field trip. If you were here last year, we did the T-Tech, SIM, ANTP collab event at the Briar Creek Country Club. It's a great opportunity for us to network with those other IT associations in town. It was at the Briar Creek Country Club last year. It will be our third time doing it. I'm assuming we'll go back to Briar Creek, but stay tuned to find out more about the May event. June is back here with our math mentorship speed networking night, and then July will be a summer social. Last year we were at Clouds Brewery for both July and December. I know it will be this year, and there might be another field trip. But save the dates. We're always second Thursday, and we have a lot of good programming. Next month will be a hit, our Women in Tech panel. We have four esteemed women in IT at different levels of their career as their panelists that we're really excited about. If we can get to 60 people to register, we can do this room. <laughs> and then, <laughs> special announcement for our friends and partners at Sims. Um, they have an event this month that is the casino night. She asked me to plug it. So those of you that are IT practitioners, you don't have to be a Sim member. You can still buy a ticket and come and join in the fun. It is a charity event to support three IT nonprofits, Aparo, Rewriting the Code, and Sim. Um, the SIM RTP Women Group is hosting it. It's February 22nd, and there's links on LinkedIn, and if you follow me on LinkedIn, you've seen the posts and the links, but there's other ways to find it. But special announcement for those friends. And you can bring a spouse. And you can bring a partner. Yeah, exactly. A spouse or a partner is welcome to come. It'll be a fun night. <laughs> if you're comfortable with them being in the same room at the same time, that's on you, and the cool might to judge. The more the merrier. Um, we have a lot of new members, so on your left side is our new annual members from the last 30 days. Raise your hand. I saw, I saw Harrison. I know Harrison. Hello. Glenn's here. Glenn's here. Well, Elliot, I saw you. Welcome. And then our new... Three month members that are like try before you commit, just dating us, not sure if they're ready for the ring. <laughs> Friends are here on the right hand side, so welcome to you, our 90 day members, day month members. Thank you. Our membership is exploding and growing, and we're really excited. We're bigger than we go for bed. And we love seeing new faces, guests, and members. All right. 
so membership, if you're not a member and you're a guest, here's how you can join. We have a couple of options. We have our annual membership, which is a 12-month membership. It is not calendar year. It's based on the month that you enroll. It includes 12 months of programming, networking, dinners, speakers, etc. Um, we crunched the numbers. I had some people smarter than me help me with the data from last year and figure out our break-even cost of membership. And while we are a nonprofit, we can't afford to go bankrupt in throwing these events. And so we looked at the average cost of a dinner, plus our operating expense, plus average attendance. We came up with a really cool mathematical formula for smart people in the room. And we came up with a number. And our break-even number is $279. We were previously charging $195 for our annual membership. And you don't have to be smart to realize that we are $80 negative or more, $84, so we have to raise our dues this year. This only is effective at your renewal date, so if you already renewed and you don't renew again until September or October, at your renewal date, the new rate will be enforced, but I'm giving people two months heads up and notice that April 1st, our dues will be increasing for the annual membership. If you're not a member now, yet, now would be a good time to join at the existing place. <laughs> Um, if you're coming up for renewal, like in April or May, now would be a great time to renew before the new prices show up on our website. But again, we're a nonprofit. We're trying to put on a really good value-added programming for a really good price, and um, you just need to adjust those prices due to the cost of throwing these events. Have you been to the grocery store lately? <laughs> <laughs> Um, quarterly membership will remain at the $90, Gas membership will remain at the $45, and um, you can proxy your seat if you can't attend, and if you need to know how to proxy your seat, I have a slide later, but also anyone on our board can help you with that. There's our website, you can reach out to Brooke, that's his email. Um, we also have group membership, and we are fortunate we have four group members now. Um, and we're happy this was a new membership offering last year. This is more of a corporate membership. It allows for someone at a company to purchase a membership and then designate who they want to attend each event given the topic or use it for more of a benefit, special recognition or reward for members of the team. You get a cool promo code to help you with your logins, but it's not an individual membership. It's more of a company membership. And that price will also be increasing um, at the end of the year, at your renewal date, Tracy, you already renewed, so you're good for a year. Um, <laughs> but um, again, given the price of throwing these events and five people coming 12 months and doing math that was shared with me with, with really good spreadsheets and data analytics for our smart people on our board, we are coming up with this number for our new five-year membership number. If you have any questions, I believe in full transparency. I'm a pretty direct communicator. I'm happy to share with you anything you want to know about how we gain these numbers. Um, and then my friendly reminder, I got rid of my Oprah slide. I think that was like bold, and I felt like I was repeating myself. But accurate headcount helps us. Early registration helps us get this big room. If we can get to 60 people. So if you know that you want to come and you're a member, then we're going to open up registration for our Women in Tech um, panel for our March 14th event tonight. Tonight, tonight, tonight. And you can go ahead and register and help us get to our headcount and get us our big room. If you can't come, here are the instructions of how you can register your guest to come as your proxy and take your seat. And there's lots of ways to sponsor us. So if you have marketing dollars in your budget this year that you want to spend on a nonprofit that is an IT association that has a lot of job seekers, candidates, employees, managers, we have a really great audience of your target audience for you here. There's a lot of different ways to get involved. These social sponsors are how we do our July and December and offsite events and take field trips that are outside of this location because if I could be honest, we had a ton of fun at Pendo. Everyone that was there had a lot of fun at Pendo. Pendo was our most expensive event we had <laughs> per person, per headcount to take to And thank you to our new 2024 annual sponsor, Corsica. 
Is anyone from Corsica in the audience today? We still appreciate you and thank you for your support. Yeah. All right, enough about me. Let's talk about Ken and John, our speakers tonight. Um, these guys, I've known for a, a really long time. I won't go into all the personal detail of how I know these guys, but they're both, they really care about the people first in their leadership style, their coaching style, their transactional style. And so they're going to tell you a little bit about a book that they just came out with. We're the first to know about their new release of their new book. I don't think it's available in print yet until February 19th is what I heard. But um, to talk about how we can improve as leaders and move from transactional to thoughtful and transcendent leaders. Um, they're very well esteemed. They're both previous authors. Um, if I can be vulnerable, it's my goal to be an author at some point in my career. So I look up to these guys um, immensely with their books and now their next book and their next release. And I have the privilege of partnering with them in some of our outside adventures. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Ken Russell and Don Ruppel to your comfy chairs that are a little bit higher so people can see you. Adults, 
And so that started. And so at that, ever since that, well, I, and then when I was in my MBA class, and this thing about transformational leadership and the four core elements, what transformational leadership is, it was like fireworks going off. I said, ah, that's who and what I am. I finally figured it out. I'm that transformational leader. And it came from the four core elements. Excellent. So my path was, uh, you know, deeply similar in the young part of it. Uh, I have uh, my first experience with leadership was when I was 15 years old, uh, when I had a chance to uh, be an intern at a music store in Charlotte. And I didn't know it at the time. Uh, I, I just, you know, was applying for an internship. And apparently, that's the first step, is asking for something, to be different, to do something that a lot of other kids weren't doing. That was step number one. I didn't realize it at the time. But then I got a chance to meet a very wonderful leader. Her name was Mary Bridget. And Mary ran the music store in Charlotte. And I learned so much from that lady. And she was wonderful. She let me not only do the, the typical stuff they let kids do, which is nothing, right? <laughs> uh, but she let me work with the guitars, which is what I wanted to do. Okay? She let me work on helping fix the guitars, which was great. And she helped me, she let me work on the business side of it, too. So I got a chance to be a part of all that at 15 years old. And it kind of changed my life. But also, I'll give you a quick little uh, fast forward a bit. My, my first CIO uh, opportunity occurred right about the time I was in my late 20s, which was rather young. But uh, it was with a company that uh, was acquiring companies. Um, uh, we had a $450 million line of credit from Men and Nations Bank. Uh, if you guys remember Nations Bank, now Bank of America. And we went out and bought 23 staffing companies across the country. And when I say we, it was the CEO was very entrepreneurial, very shake your hand, kiss the babies, that kind of stuff. And I was the tech geek, right? And I learned so much from him because he went out and did the whining and dining, and I was the guy that had to knit all the, the systems together. So it was a crazy time. We'll have time to talk about that later. But what I really realized then was that, you know, you, you take about a year to kind of knit these companies together, and then you sell the company, uh, $450 million on a line of credit, $750 million worth when we sold it, $2 billion by the time it became Modus. Okay. These are all wonderful numbers. The biggest number of all, I was six months away from being able to partake of any kind of, uh, of payday on that. So I just got paid. I didn't get paid. Uh, <laughs> but my colleague, who was 26, got paid like three, four million dollars because she was there six months before I was. Strange thing, in the end. Any, any, any of you guys doing MA work here? I know you do. Yeah. But yeah, it's a strange world. And I, I saw you last week. So yeah, absolutely. So, uh, uh, so leadership is an amazing thing, but what you get a little hint of today, we're going to sit down in a second, is that we started with, we started this discussion with stories, or what I call a vignette. So you want to talk about what a vignette is? So vignette, right? So I, um, part of our writing uh, activities and getting to know each other through this writing now, I would call it vignette, or vignette. And he, uh, <laughs> several times where Ken corrected me. So. <laughs> He said, I noticed you were saying it. So for the vignettes, <laughs> we had their stories. And so what we did is at every teach, uh, learning point, teaching point section of the book, however you want to say it, we came up with, hey, let's storytelling, right? Because we know in leadership, storytelling is one of the most effective ways to get, you know, where most of the learning occurs. And so that's what we tried to do is, I didn't try, we actually did, is we put together this series and we knit together this compilation of stories, of vignettes now, to take you on the journey. And that's what really the book's about is showcasing and diving deep into our journeys and hopefully for you guys and, and those that we want to help and those out there help them reflect on and then dive into their journeys too and, and bring out the best of all of us. And that's really what, what the whole journey is about. Yeah, I'd love to have a seat in the okay. conversation. So um, I'm thinking the sound may change if... Uh, if I'm sitting, but do you guys hear me in the back? I'm looking for me. Great, great. Thank you for not appreciating that. Thanks. Um, I'm glad I can see at this point in my life. I can still see back there. That's great. Um, <laughs> uh, this chair is wobbly, so you might get another surprise. <laughs> <laughs> you might go down. But um, it's okay. It's comfy. So there you are. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, leadership is an amazing thing, right, John? I mean, because when you come into it, uh, you don't. You don't get a job when you're in your 20s or 30s or you know, a boy scout to wherever you are by saying, leader wanted. <laughs> you, know, you sort of grow into the role. But uh, you read a lot of books. I mean, think about all the books you've read about leadership. I'm sure you've read all the Spencer Johnson stuff and all the Jim Collins stuff. And who, who else is a good you know, leader author? I actually, John Maxwell is 
conservatorship that inspired me. Yeah. I'll date myself. That was cassette tapes, by the way, when I first was introduced <laughs> to that. Because what? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Those things. Yeah. What's a cassette? Yeah, I, don't, I don't know. I've got CDs. Oh, I think so. Uh, but yeah, so so Warren Bennis, uh, John Potter, uh, and then the Harvard. So, you know, a lot of folks say you kind of read about it, but you really can't become a leader until you're in the seat. It doesn't have to be the leadership seat. You can be a leader no matter where you are in the organization. But uh, I like to kind of talk to John about the, there is an acid test for being a manager. So I tell the acid test. So All right. So, um, and we talked about this, and we have a vignette about this. Uh, I can't remember the funny name that I gave it, but uh, the story is just simply. Um, you can't really call yourself a manager if you've had to fire somebody. So think about that for a second. You know, we have a lot of folks that kind of grow, you know, get an organization and organizations grow and they find themselves in a position where they're a senior leader, call a leader. They've never been tested. They've never really been, you know, through the ringer, I guess you'd say. Through themselves. Absolutely. So uh, I had one situation where I was, uh, you know, one of my companies was acquired, uh, and one of the guys that was brought along with it, wonderful young man, great sales guy, could sell anything, but suddenly he had a, a EVP title and leading a sales force, which he'd never done. And then one day he had come and, and let somebody go. He could not do it. He couldn't do it, and he came to me, and again, I, I'm going to leave all the names out. But he was visibly shaken. He couldn't do it. And think about this the first time. If you've ever had to fire somebody, how difficult it is to do that. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be flippant about this, but you, know, you really have to experience things before you can become a leader. Okay? So John and I are talking about a thoughtful leader tonight. There are different kinds of leaders, of course. You know, all sorts of leaders. But as you think about you know, leadership in general, think about the experience that it takes to get there. Uh, we talk a lot about experiential learning. Uh, Peter Sandy talked about a learning organization, all those things. Uh, just remember that uh, experience matters. And and part of that is, you know, coming to experience is, part of that leaders, if you guys think back to, think about the most joyous or the most positive piece or experience you may have had in your learning. I just I want you to reflect on that for a moment. Visual that in your mind, feel in your heart, what did that feel like, the camaraderie you had, being part of that high performance team, being part of that you know, camaraderie that goes along with that. Now what I want you to do is flip that. Now let's go to the worst experience that you had, either as a leader or your leader above you, that you were part of that team and that happened to you. And how did that make you feel? And now remember that. Okay. And so that's what, you know, to the experience piece, it gets down into, you know, what are you really feeling? And that's the whole thing with thoughtfulness that we really want to pull out in today's world is we believe that we've lost a big chunk of that. You know, the new leaders coming up, uh, look at my, you know, my son and daughter and stuff that they were going through and they're going through and just, you know, their, their journey as leaders going up and the conversations we're having and getting that empathy out or getting some of these things about, and we talk about, well, dad, you're so experienced. Or, you know, some mentor, um, some young leaders that I'm mentoring. Uh, just, uh, you know, this Saturday I, have, I had a, a young man that was in tears on his uh, dining room table with his wife next to him consoling him as we went through. And he, his light bulbs went on. And he, he realized what I was teaching him about Ken and I, about trans, you know, transcendent, going from transformation to transcendent. And he opened up his heart to that, and it just a lot of emotion, and it just it, it was very, very interesting. Yeah, that's great. I think it's probably time to talk a little bit about you know the steps that we kind of came up with. Uh, who would mind advancing the slide? Oh, I didn't see it. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Sybil. All right. So I think that's right. Yeah. Um, thoughtful leader. When we talk about you know. Kind of three steps. The name of the book, by the way, which we'll see in a second, is called Transact, Transform, and Transcend. And the reason is because um, most leaders kind of find themselves at first. Their first kind of big role is a transactional leader. So think about that. 
you know, if, you, if you're worrying about uh, your reports, you got you know, numbers to hit, uh, and you still do. That never goes away, by the way. It's just that your first leadership role typically is something that you've got to manage, and that you've got to inspire something, and you've got to, you know, kind of cover the ground, right? Transaction. You want to transaction? Yeah. So, from the transactional piece, it's, you know, people ask me all the time, John, what's the difference between transactional and transformational? And so, it's, it's, to me, it, it's keep it simple. Keep this stuff simple. It's the transaction. How do you negotiate the transaction? And that's typically where a lot of the young leaders come in and they, they you know, give orders on the boss. You can, you know, I can tell you what to do now. And I got that manager title or team leader title. And so, but it's really how to negotiate that transaction. And, familiar. Yeah, it's still familiar. We, we come into these organizations, and you know, think about some of the big uh, organizations out there, industries, I mean, insurance, health tech, uh, finance, those are all heavily transactional based uh, environments, right? So it's not a surprise, it's just it's very limiting. You can go your entire career being a transactional leader and do quite well, right? Because yeah. you're covering, you, you meet your numbers, and you know, you have to do these things, but there are there's more out there for leaders. And that's why people kind of gravitate some of these uh, between John Connor books or Warren Bennis books or John Maxwell books or whoever it was. Hopefully a uh, Ken Russell and John Google book. Um, <laughs> but, but I think that's what's exciting about it is that there's more out there than just transactions. And that's where the transformational is when you when you make that leap, and this is the thing about the transformational leadership that hit me in an aha moment when I saw that four core elements is that I realized that what's unique about the transformational leader is using those four core elements you now have a mini process, a repeatable process that works in pretty much any situation that mitigates 80 to 90 percent of why our peers fail in their leadership moment. Due to communication, engagement, and it's all about using vision. And that's what we talk about, you know, the diagrams in the book, and we'll, you know, you can see that in the book. But that that to me was the big epiphany is I realized I didn't know it, but I'm actually tapping into this mini process as I'm working through people using vision talking about vision, tapping into that in their brains, and that's where the innovation can come. And that's where I talk about it as the difference between from being that transactional to the transformational, and what I see in others is your ability to harness the innovation, untapped innovation. So if you go into an environment that's been mostly trans led by transactional leaders, and you come in as that transformational leader, you've got a fresh, fertile soil, all these ideas, and your method of leadership now unbridles <coughs> And now you have all that innovation coming out, and people look at you like you're magic. No, I'm not magic. You're just listening to your people now. You're, you're, you've had it all the time. It's not me. It's your your team, your, your yeah. company. I think I think transformational leaders have kind of emerged over the past ten years or so, really, as organizations have been doing transformation efforts. Right? Well, what, what does that mean? Uh, you know, a transformational leader uh, focuses more on consuming what your organization can do and what its capabilities are, as opposed to creating brand new stuff that you have to measure and then transact and that, that kind of stuff. So typically, a transformational leader will take what you've got and shake it up in a way that makes more sense for that organization. Okay? Um, the, the term I like to use is amplify. The, the transformational leader amplifies what they've got. So think about it this way. Um, what's a popular um, role in any organization, particularly technology organizations, so called technology folks, uh, it would be a DBA, right? It's still, after all these years, 30 years, we've had DBAs. Um, I'm sure that at one time or another, somebody in this room was a DBA, or maybe still is. But are you still doing SQL select statements? Are you still just doing reports? No. DBAs are doing all sorts of things. In fact, a DBA, I'd probably say, is more of a database amplifier. All right? So in a transformational world, a transformational leader amplifies things because it's what you can get out of those data. Uh, we have a cool little story in the book. Uh, you can write this one down. It's called Data Manure. <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you. Uh, yeah. I'm going to do it tonight. So, so the, the idea is this. So data is not really valuable to us, really, by itself. We have to have something happen to it. It needs to turn into information. All right? So there's a, we have this kind of progression about where we are in this uh, you know, world and this uh, data thing. So maybe years ago we had data, and it was okay just to be, it was, it was profitable just to kind of, you know, do reports and manage data and that sort of stuff, and move from here to there. But now, uh, data science has changed so much that you can't just have data or even information or even knowledge. That's not even enough. So you got data, information, and knowledge, right? Not enough. It's only when you have 
insight and wisdom to kind of accompany that, and you actually do something amazing with data. So think about that in your head. Data turns into information, information turns into knowledge. This is where we're about 10 years ago. And then that knowledge thing, insight and wisdom, that's interesting. That's an interesting uh, change. Because can everybody be part of that? Or is it just a leader? It used to be that you know that insight and wisdom part was the exclusive realm of the leader. But now, the 19-year-old sophomore sitting in a data science class down the street at, at NC State, she's already learning how to get insight from data. Whereas 10 years ago, that wasn't happening. So I'll leave you for the last one. What's happening after you know data, information, knowledge, insight, wisdom, and what's the next one? Discernment. Discernment. Yeah. Discern. So what's discernment? It's, it's interesting. The ability to kind of take all that you see out there, look above the fray, as we call it, and make those one or two degree changes, not the 45 or 90 degree changes that you have in transformation. Because remember what transformation is. It's this idea, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to go this way. That's a, that's a lot of degrees, right? And that's hard. So the ability to discern is an incredible ability. So John and I kind of came up with this term called not just a transactional leader, not just a transformational leader, but a thoughtful leader. This still is one more, but I'm going to hold on to that for a second. So a thoughtful leader is transformational and transactional. Again, you don't give it up. You're not going to be one or the other. You're, you're all of those things. And this gets into flowing value to the customer. And that's one of the things that we, you know, when we're going into organizations today and working with leaders today, we ask them, you know, what, what is your journey about? And what are you doing? And you know, I had a, some good conversations. Uh, and Harrison and I were having a, a conversation, or I got to meet him, so I came to that conversation today. We're talking about, and he, you know, he asked me, are you guys using full metrics? And absolutely. But we were talking about how organizations don't understand what that is. And so when we talk about flowing data, bringing data to life, visualizing the data, what's the, what's the common factor you can rally people around? And getting that common, that common visualization focus point for everybody, their imagination starts going and start thinking about it. And that's where you know like the wins get insights into wisdoms and or wisdom. And that's coming into now you have people with decades of experience working side by side with people that are seeing data fresh with a fresh mind and being creative. And now there's innovation coming from the younger generations with the older generations and it's mixing the way that the older generations haven't had before. Those leaders in those leadership positions haven't been in technology in quite some time. So it gets back into that flow. And that's pretty much what we're doing with elevating between the different types of leadership. We're also elevating the uh, evolution or you know, how you use that data. And then how do you think about it as people working with another? What's our cause and what are we trying to accomplish? I think that's a good segue into what you've been looking at on the board here for a, on the screen here for a while. We have a little bit of a subliminal kind of message in there. I'm going to go ahead and play it out for you. There you go. So, um, we talked about discern, and we talked about um, empathy a little bit. Let's talk a little bit more about all, all of those things you see up there and highlight it in yellow. We'll start with listening. I think a thoughtful leader listens. Okay? And yeah, I've got a mnemonic uh, acronym hook up with that, and I'll, I'll give that to you in a second here. But, but think about what we say there. It's this idea of this idea you know, their, their heart, their experiences, their informed gut. And one of the early um, experiences I had with John meeting him was when he was doing his book, uh, Intuition. He asked me to do a contribution, and I, I talked about, you know, well, intuition is this kind of combination between the informed gut and the innate. You know, the, what you're born with versus what you experience. And that sort of took us on a run, which is where we are today, is that, you know, wow, you know, uh, an experienced leader listens. So then I thought, okay, experienced leader, thoughtful leader, that, that actually works. So uh, listen. Okay, you have to break the, the acronym now. So when you listen, and I mean really authentically listen, and again, you know the difference between authentic listening and listening? It's the idea that uh, authentic listeners actually pay attention to what someone is saying. Uh, a lot of listeners will just listen for someone to stop talking, so they can start talking, right? <laughs> so that, that's, that's common. So I came up with this mnemonic, and it's um, L is for learn. Okay, Learn as much as you can about as much as you can. Um, Henry James uh, said that we should all endeavor to become one of them nothing. So you kind of take that to the extreme. You should say, okay, I want to learn as much as I can about you know, what's going on in this room. And 
And I'm going to find out why are we do we have echoes with our, our speaker. I'm going to find out, you know, what are they doing in the kitchen there that's making that clinking? <laughs> okay. So we're, we, it's all around us. We tend to tune a lot of that stuff out. And as leaders, <coughs> transactional leaders especially, they will tune out things that they should be paying attention to. Uh, one great story was uh, um, um, uh, Shakespeare. Remember that guy? He wrote a play called Henry V. He wrote about uh, Henry V visiting the troops uh, the night before the Battle of Agincourt, right? But he didn't go dressed up in kingly robes, did he? He went out hidden so he could walk among the troops and actually get their real feelings, what they were really thinking, what they were really experiencing before the battle. Okay. The leader does that kind of thing. They listen, okay, so they can learn. All right, so um, I'm going to go ahead and just okay? So um, learn, and I is for interpret. Now you interpret those learnings. You know, what does it mean? What does it mean in this context? What does it mean to this organization? And then S is for shape. You shape those learnings so you can actually do something with that and not just leave it on the shelf. We had a good discussion last week about strategic plans. Where is it? I'm looking at it. Yeah, did we? And we talked about how sometimes you've got a strategic plan, you, you write it out, and you put it on a shelf, and you bring it out the next year, and you go, and dust it off. You, know, you can't do that. You have to use those learnings to shape what you do. And then um, T is for transform. And only then you do the LIS and you do the T, which is transform. Here's the fun part. The thoughtful leader comes in on the E and the N. E is for evolve. So you're evolving the organization, okay? Not just transforming it. It's one step more. It's one step above the fray. And then N, this is the fun part of a leader, a thoughtful leader. And that's you get a chance to nurture the organization. Help it continue. Yeah. All right, so back to you. So that's where you put it all together. Again, going back to what I want to emphasize is the, the common threads are a book you're going to we hear us talk about the fray, right? All the noise and stuff going on, getting above that. And the the only way that you can achieve getting above that fray is to tap into the mnemonics that Ken's providing us and getting ourselves to think a little differently and be more thoughtful and thinking of others. And just going back to the golden rule, in different situations, treat others like you would want to be treated. Think about when you're going to have to make a tough decision and somebody on that other side is going to be receiving the impact of that decision as that leader, then that's something that, you know, put yourself in that position. It, it's not going to change what we have to do, like if you're going to let somebody go, but it's going to, what it's going to do is by being, putting the role playing and putting yourself through that, it's going to open up that thoughtfulness part of you. And again, that's the common trip to the underlying theme that you're going to see in, in Throughout the book and throughout, you know, how we work with our clients and what we do with people, that's the that's the key differentiator there. And we're we'll working with folks. It's empathy, right? So empathy is the next phase, right? It is, you know, being in that situation. Um, some of my best friends who were leaders in large organizations couldn't tell you what's going on in their teams. They just couldn't. It's too hard for them to take that moment to just walk along the hallway, walk in those shoes. So. Uh, a thoughtful leader is sympathetic. And so part of this is, you know, you know, it, it's hard. So I'm gonna do this. How many of you guys, how many of you guys have consider yourselves an empath or actually use empathy in your leadership today? You guys? Okay. Um, how hard is it? You know, somebody that raised your hand, how was it easy or hard for you to, to get comfortable with being that empath or being showing that empathy. Is that easy? Does that come natural? Yeah, we've got to see some heads. Yeah, anybody saying no? Okay. Is it uncomfortable at times? Yeah, a little bit so so. Okay, seeing that. Yeah. And that's the whole thing is we have to be able to be uncomfortable ourselves. And that that's that to me was the trick for myself with the empathy side is how can I really be truly honest with myself, looking in that mirror. And that, you know, that person that, you know, inside of me looking back at me, what, who's that really looking back at me in the mirror? And there's times where I've actually used that, where I would have to make a hard decision or even a joyous decision, something that's going to change somebody's life. And, it, you know, just really a great thing going on. I would still go through the same routine or same approach. And that is where I realized that being that thoughtful, and that's where people, you know, one of the, one of the, I was in a transformation that was really, really ugly. And the lawyers were involved, 
And this was a, I can't mention, I'm not going to mention names because it's a brand name you guys all know. It's a big name in America here, a global brand. And then two girls, the service company, and then the people that we were doing the transformation for. And one, when we got all done, the lawyers took me outside the room. I was the last one of the operational team there because I had all the evidence and I gave my notes. Or the, the, the docket or the information was put on all the dockets because I was the one that controlled those notes in that video. <laughs> And when I got all done, the lawyers came out and said, John, how, how can you sleep at night? How can you, there's so much stuff here, how can you deal with all of this? And I said, well, I go, look, it's not us versus them. We're in this transformation together. They're trying to do something, we're trying to do something. Yes, there's some foul play going on, and some, there's some players that aren't playing fair or playing right or more ethical, how do you want to say that? But at the bottom of the day, we're all people, and we're all just trying to do, we're trying to get through this together. So if I can make it easier for all of us to get through this together and do the right thing for everybody, then that's what we're going to go do. And that's why I'm working with you guys, the lawyers, guys and gals and lawyers, to get, let's get both sides together, and let's figure out how we can do this the most amicable way. And in the end, there was some foul play that got called out, but that's where the lawyer thanked me and said, hey, John, thank you for that insight because you see it from a way that we don't and we can't. And because of that and bringing that to us, it's opened us up a little bit so we can be, show some empathy there, you know, and because that, that this is, you've taught me a lesson. You know, uh, just kind of give you guys a, a, a time check here. We're going to finish up in about five minutes and then we'll toss it to Q&A. Just let you know, but. I want to talk about what John's kind of leading to. I was thinking you would say the word. I said, say what, say what, say what. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the idea of empathy uh, is, is obviously, you're, you're right about that. But part of what you did in that example you shared with us is that you absorbed so much. You know, you have a sponge. Yes, you say that there. Yeah, be a sponge. So, okay, we're done. <laughs> um, so, and that's true, right? Again, if you, if you kind of follow the idea that we talked about before about learning as much as you can about as much as you can. Being a sponge sort of kind of goes along with it, being able to absorb. It's not about, you know, reading a report or doing something for, you know, your boss, you know, and then forgetting about it next week. It's, it's taking it in and absorbing it. And then if you're an empathetic person and you, you, you work hard to, to listen, then it becomes easier to absorb. Uh, sometimes you've got to say it's overwhelming, but a good leader takes the time to soak it all in and think about it and consider it. And you may not have the answer the next day. It may hit you at 4 o'clock in the morning a week later, but aha, you'll have that aha moment of discovery. Right? Uh, we like to call some of these things collisions, where you know you have an idea, I have an idea. Uh, together, they're great ideas, but to really together, they're even better ideas. It's sort of that peanut butter and chocolate moment. And when I say that, you know, the little Reese's peanut butter cup commercial, you're know, running down the hallway with a jar of peanut butter, and someone's running down the hallway with a bar of chocolate. Bam! You know? Something really wonderful. So, so now you've got listen, you've got empathy, you've got absorb, you've already talked about concern. What does that spell? Okay, I'll say it. Lead! Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Not so subliminal. But anyway, listen, empathize, absorb, discern. Uh, that's it. There, there's a cute little thing. So the book comes out uh, 219, February 19th. Why is February 19th so important, John? Well, we decided we realized it's President's Day. And what better day to have a leadership launch leadership book launch than the leader of our country who we'll celebrate the leaders of our country, great country. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah. So, yeah. We haven't really put the word up there right off of this. Go ahead and take your photo, please. <laughs> uh, but yeah, L E A D, you know, learn, empathize, absorb, and discern. And then there's the book cover, um, Transact, Transform, Transcend. So, John, in about two minutes here before we pass over to uh, uh, Q&A, above the fray, we talked about Transcend, we talked about Transform. What's so special about Transcend? So, I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, you're, you're fine. Okay, so, all right, yeah. So, I would, how many of you guys were at the NC CEO Forum in 2019? where John Chambers is the keynote speaker. Anybody get to attend that? Okay. He's a young folks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty sure we're all live. Wait. <laughs> First, ask them if they know who John Chambers is. 
Okay. Now, those of us who are familiar with Cisco, yes, but. Yeah, so, yeah, so the joke between us is Ken and I have actually shared uh, the same employer, the same clients, and same customers. And so uh, that Cisco is the tie here uh, by, between us. And John Chambers was the CEO of Cisco. And at that, you know, his claim to fame that, you know, he talked about at that keynote speech in that forum was that he, him and his team had built the, nation, the world's largest, most profitable company at that point in time. Now, that's before Amazon, but, you know, Cisco through acquisition, that, that's what he was talking about, is how big and how global Cisco would become. And what he talked about there was how he did that. And he started out the keynote speech about how many of you CEOs out there love your people? And people are like looking at each other like it's a big shock factor, like you hit them with a hammer. <laughs> and they're looking at each other and it was just in the nervousness, right? Very awkward. And he let that awkwardness set in. And so I'm sitting there smiling and go, this is great. And so then, it, and then about, you know, for the next 10 minutes or so, he talked about how he used love in his leadership style. And that was his, that was his thing is he loved his people, genuinely loved them. And his assistant was there, and I forget her name now, but, but she was, and afterwards she came up and said, yep, what John told you is true, we love you, you know, we, we love each other. And then, for the rest of that conference, 50% of the CEOs that stood up said, I love my people too. Some did, but it was very <laughs> interesting. And to this day, I'm thinking about, if John, if John would not have you know, said that up front as the keynote, who would have the courage, I call it the two C's, courage and commitment, to say that they can actually love their people? And why is that so important? That is the segue to be above the prey and to discern it, and discern it, to get to that transcendent leader. Yeah, exactly right. And, and I'll, I'll say a few more words because I, I can't do any better than that. I mean, John was and is a great person, and joy and love, that was his message that day. Joy and love. And you don't expect that from a Fortune 100. Leader. But it, it, he lived that way, and, and that was what drew me to Cisco. When I, when I left the North Carolina Research Campus, uh, I went to Cisco to work with John Chambers, and it was, I'm glad I did, because he like, retired like, a couple years later. But what's really interesting about um, that approach is that he was an above the career leader. If you look at the stuff that he did, whether he was in at Cisco doing stuff with the technical folks, or whether he was in Davos, you know, you know mucking it up with all the, you know, all the folks across the ocean. Uh, the message was the same. He wanted to kind of create an environment where technology enabled so much, right? And I think that's what when John and I started talking about, is that, you know, people are kind of stuck in transformation. In fact, if you're not careful with transformation, you kind of get in that rut and you're always transforming something and never really make, let things stick. Well, the transformation, the transcendent leader is that next step. It's look about the fray, listen to all the things that are going around you, including the clattering in the kitchen, Clattering in the hallway, even the hallway is virtual these days, right? You can pay attention. Body language is still available on Zoom, and you can kind of see what's going on. But transcendent, you know, rise above it. Uh, I think all these words that we've been talking about today: transact, transform, transcend. What does trans mean? Any Latin folks here? Yeah, no, I don't know that word, but I did study Latin. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, not very well. <laughs> Well, which means part of it, moving from one to the other, moving across. Right. Yeah. yeah. So if you wanted to say, if you want to impress your friends with, you know, you're going to go for a transambulation today, what are you saying? Cross languages. <laughs> transambulate is to walk across. No one uses so, that word. I know. <laughs> no. Except Ken. I, I will tell you one thing. You know, years ago, I, I was giving a similar speech, and the whole room was full of people, and uh, I, I used the, the Latin jokes. They all flat. Every person on it felt flat, except for one guy in the back. That one guy in the back was the librarian. <laughs> <laughs> he got the joke. But anyway, the point is, that's what we chose transact, transform, and transcend, because we're all in that kind of, no matter what day is, whatever the, the events that are come around us, we're going to be one of those. We're going to be a thoughtful leader. So that's what we said, this idea of becoming a thoughtful leader, stories from the journey. And we hope that you guys uh, picked that up in, on, on this, the 19th. You want to go ahead and check the next slide? Okay. I'll just talk about the infographic. Yeah, so uh, believe it or not, these graphics are from a high school student that is practicing illustrating. And so we actually.
asked Ella, who's her name, and so we said, Ella, why don't you just take a crack at this, take a shot at this? So she's the one who's created a whole series of illustrations for the book. And we asked her, we, we gave her some pretty blank terms, or, or you know, generic terms, said, hey, here's some of the criteria, here's what, we, there's a table we have in the book about the different types of leaders, and we said, we want an avatar, and we want it to be uh, general as we can, but then, but we still want to show these emotions for this type of leadership. And so this is what she, you know, these are her illustrations for that. I was, I was very pleased. What we don't have is we don't have a name for this character. You guys want to name it? Let's start with a T. T? Tabitha? I don't know. What do you think? Uh, be gender neutral. Translogical. Tori. <laughs> I like the trans part. Tori. Trans something? Translogical. I like it. Okay, cool. All right, next slide. Ta-da. All right, so February 19th, President's Day. Uh, this uh, QR code will take you to lead the flow. Yeah, yeah, so our website, so Intelligence Catalyst is the company that we have, and this is going to be the first of several products that we're rolling out with, and on February 19th, the on the website, there will be a link that you can go then, it'll bounce over to Amazon and go purchase the book. Now, the other piece of this is that we want to share, as we've shared our journey with you and the paths that we've followed, we would also like you to share and so part of our community building around this is we're going to have a form on there for you guys to go ahead and submit your story and share your story with us. And then in the months and years to come, we'll work with that and we just like to have each other sharing each other's stories and we'll see where it goes. Yeah. 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 Y
uh, nimble enough to, uh, to make those changes. Uh, do you want to necessarily get into a big giant company that's publicly traded where they can't really do a lot of things? It's up to you. But if you do go that way, then look for pockets of innovation, look for pockets of uh, transformational, transcendent kind of people. One thing, one thing I'll throw on that, I want to pick off that is, what we're finding is that if you have a leader above that is allowing your subculture to grow, so basically you're going to have a, it's, it's relatively easy to get a pocket of people, like Ken was saying, on this journey together and start working at. Now what's going to happen is you guys are going to be really successful, and this is what I see happen over time and time again. The leadership goes, why is this group over here being so successful? They're killing it, right? The numbers are great and all that. What I tell those leaders of that group and that effort is, hey, you're gonna because of your success, you're gonna be successful, no problem. But you're when your leadership asks you to scale and start going across the organization, the first thing you have to say is it's all about the culture we've created. And you if you want to take what this group has done, you gotta take our leadership style and culture too. Because if you don't, it's not gonna work. And then what I've said I've been so forward to say is, okay, so when companies do that, and then there are people, the leadership may not listen, say, okay, that's great, but bring it over anyways, put a red flag or put an issue ticket in, or however you, whatever mechanism you have, lever you can pull, write it in there. Leadership culture, leadership's not adopting the culture, that's an issue, a risk, and make it a risk as part of that project initiative or whatever. So then that way, coming back months or a year later, they can't say, oh, well, it, we tried, but it didn't work. Now you didn't try it because since day one I told you about the culture of leadership and you didn't want to listen to us. So that would say save, you know, protect yourself that way. One more thing about that. I know we have a person, I think, but uh, uh, and you're hovering over my plant over there, by the way. <laughs> my, my, is, is my plant, by the way. Yeah. You don't want to do it? Okay. Uh, that's why. So, so you mentioned a very important word, culture. All right, so we're all technical. We've been dealing with technical debt for a long time. Technical debt is always a big discussion in our planning sessions, things like that. But how many times have you guys talked about cultural debt? Oh, I've got a couple. Excellent. This is starting to happen. Most folks don't. So what the heck is cultural debt? So what's exactly what you're talking about? So uh, we have a section in the book. We would love to tell you more about it, honestly. But guess what? We're close to time. Anybody have any questions here? <coughs> Michael, you want to do it? You don't have to, by the way. I, I was just being said. I didn't want to hold the floor with my story, so um, just want to get my thought on leadership. You know, I only really had one shot so far in my life. Hopefully, I'll get another opportunity to be more of a leader uh, going forward. Um, I had a leadership opportunity, which interestingly enough has to do with AITP, not just formally being on the board, but uh, beforehand, actually, I was a student leader of an AITP chapter. Long time ago, we did that. But in that, I learned so many lessons. But to, to shorten the story real fast, because we're short on time, the major lesson I learned at the end of it was when it came, you know, our chapter or our, our student group was so successful. I was able to accomplish our goals, which was have students to learn about new topics, have them meet other people uh, in the industry of IT, and finally, help connect them with jobs. And of course, I didn't get a job through that because I was too busy being a leader to make sure that the people within the group, that their needs were met before my own. That was kind of one thing that I learned too. But the biggest thing I learned at the end of that experience was that at some point in time, the tough part about being a leader is you got to pass on the baton. And the thing that I learned about that was the difference between what makes a good leader a great leader, it's not necessarily about the things you do or don't do, such as accomplishing your goals, while you're in that position of leadership. Rather, it's the example that you leave behind for others to follow, as you have. So that, just want to kind of point that out there, maybe that would be a future story included in your next book. I think it's a great story, it's a great story to end on, but you notice what he did there, he started off by being a transactional leader, and he ended up being a transcendent. With that, Michael, thank you very much, and thank you, folks. Oh, one more. I didn't see that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Now, Tim, if you want to finish, we're good. No, that's okay. Go for it, Tim. Yeah. Uh, no worries. Uh, so, the E and the N is 
really resonated with me. Um, I'm not in a leadership role right now. But obviously, the experience I had in my industry, um, I'm always looked at as a leader. The be in the end part of that. Can you talk just like in your experience, how difficult is that, right? And where does that come from? In my opinion, like for me, earlier in my career, I, would, I didn't have the be in the end. That came later with experience and with maturity and just you know, age, right? Maybe being a father, uh, you get more of that. But just in your experience, I mean, one of the things that I now look for in people that I work with and work for is the be in the end, right? Okay, uh, so thank you, Tim. Uh, yeah. So he's, he's talking about uh, evolving and nurturing, the, the last part of listen, right? Um, <coughs> So, so, and you're right, this idea of, of thoughtful leader evolves and the time it takes to nurture a team, you know, and you're right, a lot of it comes from experience, but I think more of it comes from learning and being a good learner and taking the time to um, kind of digest it, absorb it, as we said before, and evolution comes from that. Uh, evolution comes from trying things, again, Called it in the past, we called it you know, failing fast and that sort of thing. But the idea of not being scared to do that and having the room to do that and having the space to do that. Uh, the nurturing thing's a bit different. Nurturing is really caring about what happens. Uh, how many leaders have you guys have had where they just kind of, you're the stepping stone between their next gig, right? And that happens a lot. But a, a really good nurturing leader, even if they're gone, that may still happen, by the way. But are you still connect with them? That's why I think uh, LinkedIn's so wonderful. It's going on 20 years from now, and I still, I still have conversations with folks that I connected with back in 2005, right? So the idea that the nurturing doesn't stop just because the job stops, right? So there, there's your thing every 10 is, is that you know nurturing continues on. So a true leader nurtures no matter where they are and what they do. One thing I'll add to that is what I'm hearing is that you're you're speaking from wisdom now, right? You've accelerated or advanced into now that wisdom and discerning area, and and that doesn't come on your first job, right? So that, that to me is, and you said the word maturity, right? Maybe it's because I'm mature now. Um, that's, you know, so again, th those to me are the factors that when you look around and putting that together, how many people around us and leaders are thinking in that manner like you are now? And that pretty much is for you guys in the room here is I hope that everybody pays this forward, pays these messages forward to others, is that let's help each other out and let's start thinking a little differently now. Let's start thinking in this man. And that's really the catalyst of what we're trying to plant the seed here with you guys today. We dug some of these out from a secret treasure chest. These are our old speaker coins, and they're the last ones that we have. We're about to rebrand, so AITP has been on its own journey and transformation. Um, Kamtia bought us and then didn't like us and sold us off. And but we persevered, but we keep our brand. Those, I think, have the Captio logo on them. We're going to rebrand and we're going to come up with new swag for our speakers. But our speakers also get a free three month membership. I know, Ken, you're already a member because you're on our map, but John, I don't know that you are. So you can come back for the next three months and join us at future events. Next month is Women in Tech on March 14th. We hope to see you there. I'll let you all talk to these amazing people that have come, and thank you for sharing. I think we all aspire to be a thoughtful, empathetic, and trans transcendent leader. I know I am, and thank you again for both of you coming and sharing it with you with us. All right, thank you all. <laughs> see you